Um, I'm sure some of you have come across the term court siding before. It largely came into prominence at the 2014 um, Australian Open when there was a fellow um, arrested. And um, having been there and seen it happen, there were also a number of um, spectators ejected from the opening uh, game of the Cricket World Cup at the beginning of last year at Hagley Oval between New Zealand and, and Sri Lanka. Um, so if it's cricket, it's more pitch siding. But court siding is... Um, is largely the f defined as the phenomenon of relaying uh, real-time information to remote locations so that you can take advantage of technological broadcasting delays and therefore arbitrage a bet. So you've seen something happening, it doesn't appear on a TV screen remotely, so you try and get your bet in between uh, when it's going on. Now the technological parts of this are completely beyond me, but I am um, assured that they are the result of the encoding and decoding of all the compressed digital signals as they're sent through cameras in there. So that's part of it and then it's also the time um, taken for the round trip to how, however many satellite stations it goes to which is only parts of a second but by the time it bounces up and down three or four times and, and uh, goes around um, it can range from one to two seconds depending on how where it's being broadcast in some cases up to 12 or 15 seconds from the time the real events happen till it appears on a remote TV screen let's say in India or wherever. Um, now because it's, it's part of the gambling situation um, this phenomenon is routinely um, associated and often equated with uh, match fixing and spot fixing, which, if we, if we want to get a definition for that too, is corruptly organising the outcome of a game or an incident within it uh, in order to achieve a predetermined result that will yield a positive betting income for the person that's laying the bet. Um, so if you can manipulate your betting strategy by taking advantage of a technological delay, um, then that can potentially be very um, lucrative. Now because of that, or because of the match fixing and spot fixing situation, there have been a number of initiatives through sports themselves. They've taken a hard line against the possible influence of gambling. Many of the major international and national sporting organisations now have their own integrity units to monitor that sort of activity. Most sports ban their participants, coaches, administrators from wagering on any sport or at least the sport which they're involved in. And some sports also uh, prohibit gambling advertising in the venues in which they operate or on their playing strips. Now those efforts by the sports have also been bolstered by that list of uh, legislative prohibitions against match fixing that you can see there, many of which are quite new. Um, they're designed to criminalise again the practice of influencing the outcome of a sporting event or some event within it for um, let's say personal gain. Um, if you look through that, you'll note that in this country, Tasmania doesn't have a specific match-fixing piece of legislation yet. Um, the West Australians are apparently very confident that their existing prohibitions on fraud and deception will cover it. Probably does, but it's not at least specific in that way. And the Canadians have um, a bill that had got most of the way through uh, to becoming law, um, except it's stalled prior to the last federal election and will require being sort of re-upped before it can actually pass through and that hasn't happened yet but at least we've got all those things um, in place uh, now. And within all of those the wording um, varies a little bit um, but they're all um, clearly designed to ban activities which they say seek to corruptly uh, influence the outcome of a specified event. So the question then is whether court signing behaviour is covered by that wording or even should be um, because if all you're doing is relaying real-time information, you're not trying to manipulate a result or seeking to influence an outcome, you're just sending information. Now indeed, the fellow that was charged under the Victorian legislation at the 2014 Tennis Open, his charge was dropped six weeks later because the um, authorities said there was no reasonable prospect of him being convicted. The UK Gambling Commission has indicated that court siding is, as they say, unlikely to be an offence in Great Britain. And obviously, both here and in, um, at home, placing bets online or via telephone isn't illegal. Um, somebody can sit at a ground and pick up their phone, lay their bet for the TAB. There's no particular law against that. And what seems to be forgotten in a lot of this is that the bookmakers themselves also have a vested interest in protecting the integrity of the markets in which they operate. And so they don't want people to be taking advantage of a technological delay because that costs the bookies money. So they're, they're trying to make sure that nobody's taking advantage of a technological delay 
um, as well, and in fact the guy that was arrested in the Open in 2014 was actually an employee of a booking agency in the UK. So what we're talking about is that all the centres around the control and dissemination of information, and many sporting bodies if you ask them, the tennis authorities particularly, believe that they have a proprietary interest in the facts of the game. They think that they own the batsman's score or what the game score is in tennis. But there is clear Commonwealth jurisprudence, largely emanating from this country, that says there is no ownership of a spectacle and you cannot own the facts of a game. Now, for those of you who don't know Victoria Park Racing, it's not, it's not there now, but it was a race course in, uh, in the Zetland area of Sydney. Um, and through this case, the Australian High Court refused to recognise any proprietary or quasi-proprietary uh, claim in sporting spectacles. The point about the race course was, was close to Mr Taylor's house, he allowed a radio station to build a tower in his front yard so the guy with, spe with um, binoculars could look over the fence into the, into the race course and could commentate on the game and give the radio listeners all of the information about the betting prices etc etc. Um, so the race course, noting then that there were fewer people coming and paying to go in, tried as it was unsuccessfully to restrain Mr Taylor and the radio station from continuing to do this. The High Court of Australia said the right to exclude anyone from broadcasting a description of the occurrences that they can see upon the plaintiff's land is not given by law, which is to say a spectacle cannot be owned in any sense of the word, or any ordinary sense of the word. Now, in, in coming to that conclusion, the High Court of Australia did um, uh, reference and quote from the fo what was the forceful dissent in the American case of uh, International News Services and Associated Press, which we'll come to in a minute, and therefore explicitly rejected what has come to be known as the hot news uh, misappropriation analysis that was part of um, the Associated Press case. We'll come to that in a second. Now, other Australian courts after this tried to revive this notion of a tort of misappropriation using somebody else's information, unfair competition if you like, in order to take account of what became new technological advances. So this was, this was radio as we get more and more technological advances being able to disseminate information. People started to make these unfair competition arguments in terms of misappropriating somebody else's stuff. However, the uh, High Court of Australia eventually reaffirmed its rejection of both the Associated Press analysis and the, the, and the approach that they suggested in that case in, um, in more Kate Tobacco on Philip Tomorris. There's no tort of unfair competition in Australia. So if you're talking about information, you can't misappropriate somebody's information. Now, the situation in New Zealand is almost certainly the same, and um, the UK has been described as notoriously reluctant to launch out upon a sea of unfair trading or unfair competition. So we can probably deduce that it's the same in the UK. And in Canada, the British Columbia Court of Appeal um, refused to decide whether or not the tort of misappropriation of quasi-property rights formed part of the general law of Canada in that Westfair case, and then ultimately went on and said in NHL and Pepsi that there was no form of exclusive quasi-property right in the schedules, scores and popularity of a sporting competition relevant to what we're talking about, which was the Stanley Cup playoffs in that situation. Um, now that was in the circumstances of a passing off claim, but again, we can deduce fairly clearly that there is no unfair competition torts in any of these Commonwealth uh, jurisdictions. Now, the US is entirely different. Now, in this case, the Supreme Court, by majority, determined that redress for Associated Press turned entirely on the question of unfair competition in business. Associated Press, this is the same one you'd know now, um, a cooperative news gathering agency they all banded together and would use all each other's stuff. This happened during the First World War. Originally the, Ameri the um, International News Service, part of Randolph Hearst's operation, was part of AP. Uh, when the Allied powers complained about the fact that some of the stuff that Hearst was printing was a little complimentary to the bad guys, um, they got booted out of Associated Press, which made it a bit difficult for them to publish newspapers in the United States. But because of the time gap between the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States, the INS guys were accessing the AP um, wire feeds. They were getting their newspapers published on the East Coast, rewriting them and publishing them on the West Coast, using all the information without attribution. Um, 
So what AP alleged was that INS was taking or indeed misappropriating all this news information, which of course depended for its value on how quickly you could get it there, um, and was therefore uh, misappropriating the accuracy and impartiality of the Associated Press news reports. Now the court said that AP couldn't assert a general right of property since current affairs news is not something that can be regarded as common property, but they did say that competitors involved in the same legitimate field of business were under a duty to conduct their own business so as not to necessarily unfair or unfairly injure that of another. And so the relationship came between how these people com um, competed with each other and it was because of that competition where you get these quasi-property rights arising. So as information was the core of the business and um, AP was collecting all this information about the war at their own cost and enterprise and organisation and skill, a competitor, the Supreme Court said, could not seek to reap where they had, so had not sown and, um, and therefore um, INS was found to be misappropriating AP's quasi-property rights in the news. Now, following that, there were a number of um, sporting um, cases, um, sorry, that's, that's what the Supreme Court said, the transaction speaks for itself, it's unfair competition in business. Now after um, AP, uh, there were a number of cases in um, the United States in a sporting context where they successfully argued that the unauthorised broadcasting of a sporting event uh, amounted to misappropriation of the novelty and freshness of the sporting event. Um, for our purposes, Pittsburgh Athletic is probably the best one because um, it has a very similar um, fact matrix to Victoria Park Racing. Um, there was a Pittsburgh radio station was broadcasting play-by-play -play descriptions of baseball games that they could get from people from outside the stadium and, that, and by using that information they were directly um, interfering, the court said, with the exclusive broadcast rights that the Pittsburgh Pirates had granted to an exclusive radio broadcaster. Um, so they were successful in restraining those activities. So the test for intervention by the US courts seems to have become whether a third party was free riding on somebody's efforts to collect or create this information and using those um, efforts of organisation and disseminating information, misappropriating it as, as news, um, which of course has implications for what courtsiders are doing if we seek to believe that this is misappropriation. As it happens, however, even the United States, as, as technology developed, the um, result isn't that clear. In this uh, NBA and Motorola case, uh, the Second Circuit Court found that Motorola had not misappropriated the NBA's information. Um, Motorola developed this thing here. I couldn't find a basketball one, so that's a baseball one. Um, what it is is, a back in the day, a handheld pager um, which remotely displayed um, updated information. They had people sitting uh, beside the, uh, side the courts um, or they were watching TV or listening to the reports on the radio. These people put stuff into their personal computers. It was then collated and sent out to the people that owned the pages so they could keep um, their game scores updated without being at the game. Um, now the court said that wasn't misappropriation as um, the NBA had failed to show that Motorola was free riding on their efforts. So they went on to say that in order for a, someone to show um, or for a defendant to fail a hot news misappropriation claim, those are the five criteria they would need. Obviously the NBA was collecting the information, it's highly time sensitive, this is the bit there's a problem here, constitutes free riding on it. What exercise the Americans to a degree was that the use of the information is in direct competition and it would stop other people doing it. At that point, um, the NBA had only just developed what became their gain stat service, so they weren't actually providing any particular type of match during the match um, score updates. So in any event, um, Motorola wouldn't have um, had a problem with the fourth one. And Sports Tracks wasn't a system that really um, did that. Then we get to that one there, um, where the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals banned a news organisation from live streaming uh, football games, which was in competition with exclusive broadcast rights that the WIAA had already granted to somebody else. Um, for our purposes, it's important to note that the um, court said that the WIAA did not have a property right in its tournament games, um, which uh, tends to reinforce the scope and ambit of the uh, contractual restrictions then that somebody that a, an event organiser can impose upon um, a potential broadcaster. Uh, in this case, they allowed them to broadcast 
things, but nobody was allowed to uh, blog from the side of the, of the games. That being the point, a lot of this seems to then um, result from contractual arrangements. So is contract the answer, particularly if you want to stop courtsiders relaying information when you don't have a misappropriation tort? Now, the Associated Press, the US case, had actually quoted from this earlier UK case um, where the assignee of the right to photograph pictures at a dog show was refused an injunction against the defendant who had also taken pictures of the show and was separately publishing them. The court said that the possession of the land occupied by the show, that is the arena where the dogs were, enabled the proprietors, that is the dog show owners, to exclude people or allow them entry on the condition they agreed not to take photographs. Now they hadn't done that in this case, so the court said the organisers then had no exclusive right to, or, or to claim an exclusive right for photography, photography because they hadn't sought to contractually exclude anybody from doing that. So it seems then that an organiser of an event, particularly where they can restrict entry, um, can create a quasi-property right in the effects of the event through that physical exclusion and impose that right through, let's shall we say, appropriate contractual arrangements, which is in fact the basis for a number of those um, broadcasting deals that happened in um, the United States. Um, so, as they even said in Victoria Park Racing, it's competent for the promoter to impose a condition on the right it granted to any patron to enter that he would not communicate to anyone outside the race course the knowledge about what was going on inside. Again, that has clear implications for our court side, is assuming you are in a position where you have imposed that type of contractual nexus on their entry. So, not only is it a breach for a race goer to disclose the information, that also creates the possibility that it would be tortious to induce a breach of contract by disclosing the information to a third party who is broadcasting it, assuming you've got the right wording in your contract. So should an event organiser want to try and ban court siding then, it seems prudent that they would include those sorts of prescriptions within their contractual terms and conditions when people come into the ground. And that, that was, we see that that's what was actually happening in the Cricket World Cup amongst the um, Ticket terms and conditions was that people were banned from any form of betting or gambling whatsoever within the venue, and they were also banned from using any electronic advice to en device to engage in any online betting activities. Now, that, on its wording, would also, of course, ban anybody from picking up their phone to lay a bet on the TAB from within the ground. And. Um, if you look at a strict construction of the wording then, it arguably seems to indicate that the mere real, the, if you, all you're doing is relaying real-time information to another person outside the ground, even if that other person is using that information in some gambling context, then that doesn't necessarily fall under the strict ambit of that wording. So if they wanted to actually ban court citing, they would need to modify that wording to make it more explicit. And following the judicial advice we've already seen from Victoria Park Racing, including a ban on the communication of information to anyone outside the venue, would also seem prudent, which that doesn't do. So the other option is simply to ban the practice entirely at the venue, and assuming you can identify a courtsider, and that's what most grounds in the UK now do. Um, Sport Elsewhere has also moved to ban courtsiding outright. Um, there have been articles at home about them removing people from basketball games at home. Now that seems a rational response, I guess, by sports bodies who are committed to preserving the integrity of the sport and trying to avoid, shall we say, unsavoury associations with gambling, even where court siding strictly construed doesn't actually amount to gambling. Now, there is still a problem there, though, because at least in tennis, um, Court siding can, or these bans on court siders can actually be seen also as an attempt to protect the value of the tennis product. 2011, the ATP and, and the WTA made a deal to sell uh, the men's and women's scores through this Danish company called Enet Pulse, which is majority owned by IMG. Um, and Enet Pulse takes the information from the umpires who input it by the court and sell it. And they sell it to third parties, which include one of their biggest clients who just happens to be Betfair, which is the UK-based largest betting exchange in the world. 
So little wonder then that the tennis authorities having jointly invested more than about $10 million in getting all the system set up are probably wanting to um, seek to ban other courtsiders so that there's not other people sending live information from the court side. Now it's perhaps worth noting that the arrangements with uh, ENET Pulse place the tennis authorities then entirely within those five criteria that we get from uh, NBA and Motorola because anybody sitting courtside would be in direct competition with the system that um, the tennis authorities have um, set up. So that would presumably ground a misappropriation claim, except that you can't make that claim in Australia. Unhappily, and this is just one example of it, the problem with a lot of these sports is they're increasingly caught in a financial bind. They want to get rid of any taint of illegal gambling activity from their sports, but they remain some of the biggest recipients of gambling profits or gambling money. Um, for example, this year, for the first time, there was a gambling house as one of the major sponsors of the Australian Open. Now, under current Australian and New Zealand legislation, any gambling profits um, and their turnover have to be re, uh, redistributed back into the community. Uh, at least in New Zealand, that's usually directly back to the sports where the bets are placed. So if people are playing, placing bets on the NBA in the, in the United States, the uh, percentage of profit and turnover that has to be returned back to the community goes back to Basketball New Zealand. Now, the last figures I could find for the year ending 2013 for Basketball New Zealand, um, commission from sports betting amounted to 18.3% of their total income. The TAB in New Zealand is the single biggest financial contributor to basketball in New Zealand. 18.3% of the total income sports betting and another 13.3% came from grants from the gaming machines trusts, the people that own all the poker machines and pubs in New Zealand. So that's over a third of their income comes directly from gaming activities. Um, so we've got William Hill sponsoring the Australian Open, and in the UK there are a number of EPL teams, Premier League teams, that are sponsored directly by gaming operations. That's the Sunderland jersey this year, and that is the Watford jersey this year. Both of them are huge online gambling organisations that get most of their money out of China. They're not sponsoring these guys because they like football, they're sponsoring them because they see those jerseys on the TV in China. So um, we go the other way, um, at least in this country, Essendon for example, maybe it's because they've had other problems, have ended commercial partnerships with gambling agencies mid last year, got rid of them entirely. But it, it goes both ways and it's not absolutely clear then how uh, sports can continue to rationalise their aversion to gambling activities which compromise the integrity of the sport which they clearly do but in many cases they have an increasing reliance on the finance that those activities um, create. Now appropriate contractual mechanisms to, clo to control the flow of information from inside a ground while effective can only go so far and even if you have the right um, provisions in your contractual terms and conditions of entry, that might not necessarily um, stop the use of it by third parties because of the contractual nexus and all our ideas of um, privity of contract in any event. So one potential solution lies then in this, in this um, legislative scheme that is currently only in Victoria, although it's also been more or less replicated uh, in France and is an operation now also in Poland and Hungary. So that is, in the core of that just quickly, is the right to consent to bets. That means that you license particular um, sports bodies and as a result, at least in Victoria, betting operators can't um, offer any bets on Victorian sports events until they've reached a contractual agreement with the sport. And the right to consent to be having bets placed on a particular sport obviously enables those sports bodies to get direct remuneration from the gambling agency, not this redistribution situation. Um, and it's also predicated on the presence of adequate measures to ensure the integrity of the sports events uh, being bet on. That means that a sports body has to first have in place adequate integrity mechanisms and only then can it claim the right to um, consent to bets. And one of the intended outcomes then of how this works in Victoria um, was that the sports bodies would gain um, financial compensation from the betting operators to help cover the costs of running those integrity units, which makes the betting operators at least partly responsible for that as well. Now while effectively getting into bed with 
gambling operations might not work so well with a lot of sporting organisations, a scheme like this does seem to have two major advantages. One is the right to consent to bets creates a legal link between the betting operators and the sporting organisations, which increases the transparency, and it also makes the participation of sports organisation and alert systems for direct for being able to um, identify um, illegal or strange betting patterns much more effective because they're together. Two paragraphs. So while it might formally recognise um, the existence of gambling operations in the world of sport, the right to consent to bet also seems to bolster the, um, the transparency and efficacy of uh, integrity systems while at the same time guaranteeing a more direct financial return to the sport itself. Um, so ultimately, when you're in an environment where placing a bet is not an offence, it's likely that if you're worried about court siding, contractually banning that sort of practice from within sporting venues is a rational response if you want to get rid of any taint of gambling activity at all. But at least this legislative scheme might arguably be a better mechanism for ensuring the integrity of the sport, particularly when you're faced with increasing financial dependence of sports on gaming monies, although that obviously requires much greater engagement between the sports and the gaming industries. But whether court siding should be seen in the same vein as match fixing or spot fixing isn't clear, doesn't seem to be covered by a lot of the key um, legislative bans that exist at the moment, and whether a court sider is in some way illegally influencing a betting outcome, which is what most of the legislation says, is an entirely arguable point. Here we are. Mm -hmm.